Before time began, there was the cube. We know not where it comes from, only that it holds the power to create worlds and fill them with life. Your first enchilada of freedom awaits underneath one of those hoods. Let me tell you something, son. A driver don't pick the car. The car pick the driver. It's a mystical bond between man and machine. Feels good. At 1900 local time yesterday, Soxon Ford Operations Base in Qatar was attacked. We're under attack! The objective of the attack was to hack our military network. We're not sure exactly what they're after, but we do know that they were cut off during the assault. It's going after the files! Which would lead us to assume that they're going to try it again. Optimus Prime. We are autonomous robotic organisms from the planet Cybertron. Why are you here? We are here looking for the Allspark. And we must find it before Megatron. Mega what? If the Decepticons find the Allspark, they will use its power to transform Earth machines and build a new army. And the human race will be extinguished. What you're about to see is totally classified. Dear God, what is this? Are we talking about an invasion? So why Earth? It's the Allspark. Allspark? What is that? Well, yeah, they came here looking for some sort of cube-looking thing. You guys know where it is, don't you? Autobots, roll out! Transformers premiered in Sydney on the 12th of June 2007. It got its official release through Asia and parts of Europe during the following weeks of June and made its way to the USA and UK in July. In September it got a special IMAX release. The large film format has subsequently become an integral part of the sequels as the cameras were used in the filmmaking process. Transformers was produced on a huge budget of $151 million and was directed by Michael Bay. It was a financial success at the box office, making $703 million worldwide, breathing new life into the Transformers franchise, and proving to be a massive success on DVD and Blu-ray, making $303 million. Reviews at the time were generally very good. Some critics felt that this was Michael Bay's best movie to date. Roger Ebert himself gave it 3 out of 4. The film was praised for its visual effects and its explosive action scenes, but others felt the movie focused too much on the human characters and that its running time outstayed its welcome. With this movie essentially being a giant toy commercial, Hasbro had a new range of Transformers to sell to new fans of the series, and of course the hardcore collectors with tons of spare cash to further build upon their existing collection. Plans for a live action Transformers movie started back in 2003. The producer of the film, Don Murphy, who had previously worked on Natural Born Killers, Double Dragon and The League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, had originally wanted to pursue a G.I. Joe movie, but considering the political climate at the time, Hasbro suggested the idea of Transformers, which Don thought was a great idea. 
Don's friend Tom DeSanto, who had worked on X-Men 1 and 2, purchased the rights with him and pitched the idea to a number of studios in Hollywood. DreamWorks took an interest due to Steven Spielberg, who owned the company being a fan of the toys. His children were big fans during the height of the toy line's popularity in the 80s, and Steven took on the role of executive producer and set about finding a director. Robert Zemeckis was first attached. He was putting the final touches to the Polar Express at the time, and it's unclear why he decided to not take on the job and moved on to Beowulf. Spielberg approached Michael Bay in 2005, thinking his style would appeal to teenagers, but Michael dismissed the film as a stupid toy movie. Nonetheless, he wanted to work with Spielberg and gained a new respect for the concept upon visiting Hasbro. The producers had already produced a first draft that focused on the Generation 1 cartoon and comics and the Creation Matrix as their plot device. The Matrix was later renamed to the AllSpark. The script was written from a human point of view and in the style of a disaster movie. Bay considered the first draft too kiddie, so he increased the military's role in the story in an attempt to appeal to older viewers. Roberto Orsi and Alex Kurtzman, who were fans of the cartoon, were hired to rewrite the script by Michael Bay as they had worked with him on the island. Spielberg suggested that a boy in his car should be the focus because it conveyed themes of adulthood and responsibility. Orsi and Kurtzman experimented with numerous robots from the franchise, ultimately settling on the characters most popular among the filmmakers to form the final cast. Most of the Decepticons were selected before their names or roles were developed, as Hasbro had to start designing the toys. RC, the only female Autobot, was cut because they found it difficult to explain robotic gender, but she did make an appearance in the sequel with her sisters. The filmmakers created the size of each robot with the size of their vehicle mode in mind, supporting the Transformers' rationale for their choice of disguise on Earth. They had to change to something of equal size. The concept of travelling protoforms were developed by Roberto Orsi in order to explain why aliens who moonlight as vehicles need other vehicles to travel. This reflected a desire to move to a more alien look, away from the blocky Generation 1 Transformers. Underneath their disguise, they have an endoskeleton. It can then scan something and copy it based on their mass. All the original characters took on a major redesign. There are some minor visual similarities, but a lot has changed over the years with many of the vehicles used, so it was to be expected. Once fans knew Michael was attached, he received death threats due to many feeling that he was not suitable for handling the Transformers. Many petitioned to have him removed from the franchise, and as more of the new redesigns started to appear online, many fans were furious. So Michael made attempts to appease the fans by making adjustments to Optimus Prime and Megatron. The Autobots took on the disguise of sports cars and such, basically anything that wasn't threatening, while the Decepticons took on authoritarian vehicles such as police cars or anything that's part of the military. In the cartoon, Megatron would shrink down into a gun, which they felt didn't make sense. Because his character is very vain and not concerned with hiding, he turns into his Cybertronian spaceship form. Peter Cullen returned to provide his voice for Optimus Prime. Fans of the original TV show were over the moon once he was announced to be involved and became one of the highlights of the movie, receiving critical praise for his performance. Hugo Weaving, the star of The Matrix and Lord of the Rings, voices Megatron. Originally, Frank Welker, voice of Megatron in the original series, was considered, but Bay thought his voice didn't fit the new redesign, so Weaving was chosen instead. Weaving would reprise the role for parts 2 and 3, but Frank returned to voice Galvatron for Age of Extinction and Megatron for the recent fifth movie, The Last Knight. Other voice artists were brought on, Jess Harnell as Ironhide and Barricade, and Charlie Adler, who voiced Silverbolt on the original series, voices Starscream. The cast of the film is huge with a wealth of human characters. Shia LaBeouf, who had started acting at a young age and had already kick-started his movie career with parts in iRobot, Constantine and Disturbia, plays Sam Witwicky, who helps the Transformers track down the AllSpark. Megan Fox, who had started her career in modelling and had a few roles in TV before starring in Transformers, plays Michaela. Sam has a crush on her, but she doesn't even notice him in class. She eventually assists him in his mission by using skills she learned as a juvenile car thief. Josh Jumel, who would go on to star in all the Transformers movies minus the fourth one, plays Captain William Lennox, the leader of the Army Rangers team in Qatar. Tyrese Gibson as Sergeant Robert Epps, who joins Lennox at the Army base in Qatar to battle the Decepticon. Tyrese returned for parts two and three. 
Veteran actor John Voight plays John Keller, the US Secretary of Defense, who discovers the hacks on their military aren't from their usual suspects, but from sources not from this world. The always reliable John Turturro plays Seymour Simmons, a member of Sector 7, a secret division of the government that has the Allspark and Megatron hidden away. Not even the Secretary of Defense is aware of Sector 7 and their secrets. Australian actress Rachel Taylor plays Maggie Madsen, a sound analyst who is recruited by the US Defense Department to decipher a signal left by the hackers. She is the first to figure out that this is an advanced signal not from Earth. Anthony Anderson plays Glenn, an expert hacker who fears the government, but is dragged into the investigation of the Transformers when Maggie visits him with the alien signal and needs his help to decode it. And finally we have Kevin Dunn and Julie White, playing Sam's often irritating parents Ron and Judy. Well the mother is the most annoying and the dad, he's okay. The movie opens on a US military base in Qatar, where a suspicious Pavlo 4 helicopter lands and doesn't communicate with the base. It suddenly transforms and attacks the base, stealing classified files on detailing the findings on Megatron and the Allspark from their server, along with their connection to the Whitwicky family. A few remaining survivors manage to escape, but are pursued by Scorponok. We are then introduced to Sam Whitwicky, who is trying to build up funds to buy his new car. He is attempting to sell his great-grandfather's exploration gear in class, but he is unaware of their importance to the Transformers. He is taken to a car dealer where a battered 1977 Camaro appears to be following him. It parks up, appearing to him and the dealer as a car for sale. Sam wants the car, but it's a bit out of his price range. The Autobot sends out a signal destroying all the windows of the surrounding cars, and the dealer quickly agrees to sell it to Sam at a lower price. At the Pentagon, Secretary of Defense John Keller leads the investigation into the attacking guitar. Sound analyst Maggie catches another Decepticon, Frenzy, hacking into the network while on board Air Force One. While the hack is thwarted, Frenzy downloads files tracking down information on Sam with Barricade, disguised as a police car. Sam discovers his car is indeed a robot believing it was being stolen, but realizes it was driving by itself. He sees his car stand up and send out a signal into the sky, sending out a beacon to his fellow Autobots. No one believes Sam about the events, and the following day he is tracked down by Barricade. His high school crush Michaela is worried about Sam and realizes he is in trouble. At the last minute, Sam's car comes to the rescue and defeats Barricade. The Autobot approaches Sam and Michaela and introduces himself but struggles to speak and only uses the car's radio to communicate. The other Autobots have arrived and introduced themselves as Optimus Prime, Jazz, Ironhide and Ratchet. Prime informs Sam that Bumblebee is his guardian. Optimus explains that they are from the planet Cybertron that was devastated by a civil war between the two Transformer factions, the Autobots led by Optimus Prime and the Decepticons led by Megatron. Optimus Jettison, the Allspark, a mystical artifact that brings life to the planet, into space, but Megatron quickly escaped and pursued it. Megatron followed it to Earth and crash lands in the Arctic Circle, and froze before obtaining it, and was discovered centuries later in 1895 by explorer Archibald Witwicky. Witwicky activated Megatron's navigational system, which scanned the Allspark's coordinates into his glasses. Prime warns that if Megatron obtains the Allspark, he could transform Earth's machinery into a new army and exterminate mankind. ILM and Digital Domain handle the incredible visual effects, with ILM taking on 70% of the work. Having robots transform in such a detailed manner had never been done before on such a grand scale and was a great feat in visual effects. Initially, the transformations were made to follow the laws of physics, but it did not look exciting enough and was changed to be more fluid and fast. Originally they had planned to incorporate 15 transformations in the film, but it was bumped up to 40. You had them changing at different speeds, one for those epic shots so the audience got to see all the moving parts, or they would change quickly depending on how the scene was being played out. For example, for Optimus Prime they had over 10,000 parts that made up his character. That's just unbelievable. The amount of hard work and design it takes to create one character and with the wide variety of Transformers they have on screen, you can imagine the large numbers required to create the full lineup. For example, if they had three Autobots in one shot, it would take 38 hours to render one frame. Unsurprisingly, ILM had to upgrade their facility to cope with the render times. Many of the animators at ILM were big Transformer fans and were desperate to work on the movie. Michael Bay gave them a lot of freedom on the Autobots and Decepticons in deciding how they move or acted in a scene. 
The animators threw in references to the animated movie from 1986. There was a clear passion there with the FX team to really show off the Transformers, and they certainly did a great job making them look cool and dynamic on screen. Michael Bay instructed the animators to observe footage of two martial artists and numerous martial arts films to make the fights look graceful instead of having slow lumbering fights. When the Transformers are seen up close they would often move fast, but seen from a wider shot they would move slower in order to give a sense of their weight. Michael Bay, who has directed numerous car commercials, understood ray tracing was the key to making these robots look real. The CG models would look realistic based on how much of the environment was reflecting on their bodies. They took hundreds of on-set photos to make the lighting match the Transformers so that they blended with the background elements seamlessly. Steven Spielberg encouraged Bay to restrict computer-generated imagery to the robots and background elements in the action scenes. Stunts such as Bone Crusher smashing through a bus were done practically, while cameras were placed in the midst of car chases and explosions to make it look more exciting. Bay tried to do everything in camera before any CGI was added. There are miniatures in this film and there's a great shot in the film where we see Megatron has transformed into his spaceship and Prime is hanging onto him. Megatron flies through the air smashing into a building and flying through it causing tons of damage. It's an awesome visual effect and one of my favourites in the movie. The visual effects were nominated for an Academy Award but lost out to the Golden Compass which is a film I think most people have forgotten about. I think this movie clearly should have won that year because the amount of detail and time dedicated to just one Transformer is worth a round of applause and an award. Steve Jablonski composed a score to Transformers and Hans Zimmer produced it. Hans Zimmer was Steve's mentor and really helped him get a leg up in the industry. Steve had collaborated with Bay on the island and Michael thought Steve would be a good choice to tackle Transformers. Steve brought on a bunch of new themes for the characters and the Allspark, creating roughly 90 minutes of music. The score itself does take on that very familiar Hans Zimmer sound but with Steve writing, it distances itself somewhat from being another clone of Zimmer's work. The original themes he brought on gives the movie a unique soundscape and character. I was impressed with the score at the time, and it felt like a natural fit to the Transformers universe. When the Autobots arrive on Earth, it really captures the essence of those characters, and there was a great moment I love when Prime takes on Bone Crush from the motorway, which is also the best action sequence in the film. The music basically copies the Terminator which I'm sure was done on purpose as a nod to the series, as we see two robots battle each other. I'm sure fans of the classic show and animated movie were disappointed there was no attempt to update the classic theme tune, and with all the sequels they still haven't done a new take on it, which is a little frustrating. When the movie came out there was no soundtrack release available, but what fans got was an album featuring all the rock and rap music that featured in the film, from artists such as Linkin Park and the Smashing Pumpkins, the album even included songs that weren't used in the movie, and none of the score by Steve Jablonski was included. The album got pretty bad reviews, but sold relatively well. Stan Bush, who wrote the tracks for The Touch and Dare for the original animated movie, did submit two songs. One was a re-recording of the popular song The Touch to be included in the new movie, but they were rejected. I certainly wasn't a fan of the rock music with this new movie, and was trying to get my hands on Jablonski's score. Sony announced that there was no plans to release the score, so a petition was started gaining a lot of support. The score did eventually get its release two months later. There were plans afoot to release it, however it wasn't Sony who owned the music, but in fact Warner Brothers Records, who delayed the release. I think it's a great soundtrack and works really well by itself, if you enjoy listening to film music. The score is still available and can be easily obtained on Amazon. back when games based on movies were still the norm, whereas today most video games based on films tend to pop up on mobile devices and less so on consoles anymore. Transformers the game arrived a month before the film got its general release. It was released on pretty much every gaming platform at the time, the PS2 and 3, Xbox 360, Nintendo Wii, PC, PSP and the Nintendo DS. The voice talent of the film provided their services to the game such as Peter Cullen, Frank Welker, the voice of Megatron for the cartoon, takes over from Hugo Weaving and Shia LaBeouf reprises his role as Sam. The game didn't go down too well with critics, most likely due to its rushed release to tie in with the movie. 
The plot of the game loosely follows the film, and you can control the Autobots, but thankfully none of the humans, enough to track down the Allspark. Critics of the console ports praised the graphics, but the biggest problems many had with it were its dodgy camera, repetitive missions, clunky driving segments, and gameplay. The game was way too short, and suffered from unbalanced difficulty. For the portable devices such as the PSP and Nintendo DS, the games were just as bad. The PSP version is an unplayable mess, with short levels and weak graphics. The DS release came in two versions, a bit like Pokemon Red and Blue that turned up on the old Game Boy. The DS had Autobot and Decepticon versions that had different characters, missions and locations, playing like a very watered down Grand Theft Auto ripoff. You drive around empty cities battling other Transformers with cumbersome fight scenes. These games are total crap, are not worth hunting down even if you are at all interested in the franchise. Best to stick with War for Cybertron and Transformers Devastation. Now before I discuss my thoughts on the first Transformers movie, let's have a quick rundown through the sequels. Obviously due to the huge success of the first film, they went straight into production on a follow-up called Revenge of the Fallen, released in 2009. The original writers were unavailable due to scheduling problems, so DreamWorks got other writers involved but weren't happy with what was pitched to them. They eventually persuaded Orsi and Kurtzman to return, but got Aaron Kruger involved who had impressed Bay and Hasbro with his knowledge of the Transformers mythology. With the looming strike of the Writers Guild, the three writers had to quickly put together a treatment that would be expanded by Michael Bay. So come shooting, Bay pretty much finished up the script himself and remained uncredited. Critics panned the film and even Michael Bay said it was crap, reflecting on it a couple of years later. I remember seeing it at the cinema and once the end credits rolled, people around me applauded. I was shocked! Why would people clap for this rubbish? Everyone's IQ just dropped sharply around me. The movie was just an overbloated mess that was so long-winded and messy, full of racial stereotypes and an incoherent plot. Despite a huge backlash from the critics, it made a lot of money more than the first one. Come 2011, we got Dark of the Moon, the third in the series. By this point, I think most people were expecting the same sort of affair. Loud and noisy, insultingly long with its length, but we were promised that it would correct the problems of part two. This was one of the last movies I previewed when I was working as a projectionist. The movie was certainly an improvement over Revenge of the Fallen, shot in 3D. Photography wise, it was a step up over previous entries and Michael had to cut down on his fast editing for the 3D to work. So his work was actually improved when he was handicapped by the technology. The movie starts out quite well, but descends into the usual myriad of problems halfway into it. The last act is an over-bloated action finale that goes on for an hour. It was nice having Leonard Nimoy provide his voice, but that's not enough to win me over. I think when the Transformers are on screen, the films are fun, and that's what I've paid to see. But yet again, there is more focus on the human characters. A new girlfriend for Sam who spends all her time pouting, and Bay has his leery eye all over her as he frames his shots. Megan Fox didn't return to the series after publicly comparing Michael Bay to Hitler. Not the most professional thing to do, but she appears to have made things up with Bay as she now stars in the recent Turtles films, which Bay produced. Every woman in this movie, well, 95% of those who have a speaking part, or who are even in the background, is clearly a model. You can't look normal in this movie. If you do, then you are an eccentric, geeky character. These movies are incredibly shallow. In 2014, we got Age of Extinction, which introduced the Dinobots and everything else Michael Bay could to please the hardcore fans, who at this point had written off these movies. Mark Wahlberg takes over from Shia LaBeouf in the lead role. He plays a struggling inventor, which I find incredibly tough to believe. I wouldn't trust Mark to reformat my computer. I mean, I like Mark as an actor, but he ain't no inventor. This movie I didn't see at the cinema, and I think the reviews for this film were just as bad as the second one. Dark of the Moon was seen as something more bearable, but this was just universally panned. It did however make over a billion at the box office, thanks to foreign markets who seemed to love the series, making over $320 million in China alone. I caught this not long after its Blu-ray release. By God, it was one of the most boring films I had to sit through in a long time. I think it could be worse than number two. It's hard to say, they are equally as bad as each other but on a positive note, it's the best photographed of all of them. The gangs in this film got worse, they even throw in jokes to justify underage sex, which is a revolting slice of humour from Bay that should have been cut out. 
Michael Bay has serious problems with pacing and being too loose with his running time. He really struggles to tell the story in an efficient manner. So many scenes in his movies can be trimmed or just removed entirely. Large chunks never move the story along, but instead just focuses on unwanted humour or extended action scenes. I love action, but having it go on for an hour or more with little story, it becomes so tiring. I always feel exhausted after watching these sequels, with all of these movies' faults with their script, tone, length and inappropriate humour. There is no denying the visual effects, sound engineering and practical stunts are incredible. Even the great actors who turn up in these movies, clearly for a fat paycheck, do the best with the quite often rubbish material. The technical achievements are really what excel in this series, but at the end of the day, if the story is not good, then it doesn't really matter if you have all the tools at your disposal, you are going to end up with an unsatisfying film. What gets said about these movies frequently is that they are soulless, and that there is never an emotional connection making them feel very redundant. The latest Transformers movie, The Last Night, is now out in theatres. If you want to know my thoughts on that film, you can find out on episode 8 of Fix It In Post. The Transformers movie franchise has been going on for 10 years, and has been extremely profitable, which many of us struggle to get our heads around. On a critical level, they have been panned across the board by professional critics general moviegoers and of course the fans of the original cartoon and toys. For me the first movie is the only one I can tolerate and find somewhat enjoyable. It is also the only one of the series to have received positive reviews. I grew up fully aware of Transformers, but I didn't see it that often on TV. Since I reviewed the animated movie, UK followers of mine informed me that it was on quite a lot during the early 90s and it must have passed me by at the time. In the late 80s and early 90s, Transformers basically ran out of steam, but it still had a loyal fan base. Most kids, especially at my age, had moved on to Ninja Turtles and such. I had a bunch of Transformers which I picked up second hand, but I wasn't very knowledgeable of the mythology and history of the characters. So come the movie, I was intrigued to see how they were going to explain the backstory and translate essentially a toy line onto the big screen. It's a huge challenge and making Transformers interact with humans would prove to be a technical minefield. The early trailers looked very cool and the first one was at the time the most downloaded teaser on Yahoo. I wasn't a fan of Michael Bay per se, I watched a few of his movies and only really warmed to Bad Boys and The Rock. I was never a fan of Armageddon and Pearl Harbor. I do recall a lot of worried comments from the fans that having Michael attached wasn't the best choice, but I was optimistic. Thankfully the movie was, for the most part, entertaining. It did a successful job of introducing the Transformers and it balanced out the action and story relatively well. It was wonderful having Peter Cullen come back to provide his voice for Optimus Prime. It's such a warm and friendly voice, but also has that authority to it to make you sit up and listen. Bay could have easily started everything from scratch and got all new voice talent, but he listened to the fans when constructive criticism was made very early on into the film's production. What has been apparent throughout the series is that the Transformers are all secondary characters in their own story. The first film can kind of get away with it, even though it takes forever for Prime to turn up. The Transformers are arriving on Earth and you need to develop who they're going to interact with, that's fair enough, but it is apparent Bay is far more interested in the military aspect and Sam and his family. The Transformers themselves are rich characters, so they can be the stars and be centre stage. I don't know why they feel that these robots can't be given the main roles. It appears like they have a lack of confidence in the characters and it seems too risky to have them play a bigger part until there has to be another action sequence. The humour in the film does work in some areas but oftentimes is highly inappropriate, such as the joke about masturbation. This is a film fundamentally aimed at younger kids, though it's not suitable for them which demonstrates the crass kind of attitude Michael Bay has. In the sequels the sexual jokes got worse and by the fourth movie it gets out of hand. Michael in response to his critics said, I make movies for teenage boys. Oh dear, what a crime. The film's photographic style is not really to my liking. Michael Bay has a strong background in commercials and knows how to photograph cars extremely well. But everything in the movie looks greasy and grimy and often looking like a music video. The colour tones are all off the chart. Everyone looks like a carrot and the film stock is very grainy. I also think a lot of the time during the shoot, they had no idea how big the Transformers were going to be. So you have these oddly framed angles as the FX team try to fit in the Transformers to make use of what they shot. Apparently the filmmakers used a mix of anamorphic and super 35mm film stocks, so you have this inconsistent quality throughout the film. 
What the film does well, and even in the sequels, is that the dialogue given to the Transformers does sound like it's been lifted from the cartoon. It's all very simple and straight to the point. Sure, it can come across sometimes as a bit juvenile, but a good writer can easily provide them with rich dialogue. The voice talent for the Transformers is superb throughout. For many of the characters, they use actors who specialise in voiceover work, which was the right move. I do really like Optimus Prime as a character, and even Bumblebee, but out of all the Transformers in the movie, I really like Starscream the most. Yeah, I know he looks radically different to his original design, but the voice just wins me over. It sounds so evil and robotic, and it feels like a cartoon character. Plus, being a fighter jet, he seems to be the most badass out of all of them. The main villain, Megatron's biggest problem, has always been the design for me. It's just an over-engineered mess and shows no resemblance to the original design. I remember the big hoo-ha at the time when the concepts were released and how they seemed way too busy with their designs, making it often difficult to distinguish one from the other. With the first movie focusing on a small amount of Transformers, it's easy to tell them apart when they're standing still, but once they start fighting it becomes a problem. During the battle between Bumblebee and Barricade, you can barely see what's going on, it's just a bunch of metal parts being thrown at the screen. The final battle at the end, it's not so hectic, and you can tell what's happening for the most part. Michael Bay really loves the military. The film feels like a promotional video in some parts to join the army. It's patriotism overload. All these movies have this meat-headed and testosterone fueled attitude to everything in regards to guns, tanks, and anything that involves killing people. These movies are basically Team America, but minus the satire. Michael Bay should have really directed the G.I. Joe movie. That seems more his forte, as it's full-on military action. With the large cast, everyone does a very good job. No one seems wooden or gives a bad delivery, aside from Megan Fox, who is not well known for her acting skills, and is only cast due to her looks. Shia LaBeouf does get a hard time in the press and over his involvement with the series. I think Shia is a very good actor and has great comedic timing. When the comedy works in this series, he does a good job with it. Interacting with these CGI characters, he has to perform and talk to nothing off camera, and it's a challenge for an actor to do that. They have to use their imagination and he makes it very believable. I think the problem with the performances in the sequels is that the characters are turned up to 11 on how they interact and perform, so it becomes a bit grating after a while, mostly thanks to the length of these movies. Transformers has a number of glaring issues, which stops it from being a classic movie or something that is considered great. It is at its core a good action film, even though the explosions always make me chuckle since they look like giant fireworks. It's not completely over the top and keeps things self-contained, which probably is why it works better than the others. It certainly feels more focused and has a clear narrative. The movie has wonderfully executed visual effects, a rousing memorable score and some good performances that help elevate the humour when it's needed and not when it's forced or inappropriate. I'm not going to be a snob and say there isn't any entertainment value in this series. You can get some fun out of them, but I think fundamentally Transformers really needed a director who could bring out the heart of the characters and give us a slice of emotional drama, which the movie really wants to achieve but never does due to base direction and warped perspective on the world. If you are a big fan of the Transformers cartoon toys and comics and you thought this movie was total rubbish, then I completely understand. I went into this film without much knowledge and I'm not an expert on any level, so I would fully understand if you had any beef with this film or the sequels and how the franchise has been treated on a cinematic level. This movie felt like Bay was trying to impress Spielberg and there were some restrictions on him going full Michael Bay. This Transformers movie was a satisfying first entry and it showed that translating a toy to the big screen could be done successfully. But it's just a shame they didn't push the Autobots and Decepticons to the forefront in the sequels and sideline the humans to become secondary characters. At the end of the day, I've paid to see a Transformers movie and that's what I want to see. Fire it up, Optimus. The code. The code on these glasses indicates the Allspark is 230 miles from here. I sense the Decepticons are getting ready to mobilize. They must know it's here as well.
Where is the cube? The humans have taken it. You fail me yet again, Starscream. Get them! If you enjoyed the video, you can find more on my YouTube channel, and also you can follow me on Twitter. If you want to help support the channel, you can donate through Patreon and receive monthly perks such as updates on the latest news on my channel, early access to reviews and commentaries before they go live on YouTube. Even the smallest donation can help keep this channel going. Thank you.